we're going to go ahead and get started with today's event, Agile Plus DevOps Testing for Packaged Applications. And we're going to jump right into the agenda. Uh, so today we're going to be covering the how, the why and how of Agile Plus DevOps for Packaged Apps. And you're in good hands. Today joining us we have Diego Lo Giudici, Vice President, Principal Analyst serving Application Development and Delivery Professionals from Forrester Research. And we have Chris Krauss, Senior Director of Product Marketing of WorkSoft. Combine these two bring 50 years plus software application delivery experience and a wealth of personal knowledge gained from working with organizations of all sizes across the globe. With that, I'll be turning over things to our first presenter, uh, Diego, who will take us through why organizations are adopting Agile and DevOps for packaged apps and future trends. Diego? Thank you very much, Ether, and uh, hello, everybody. <clears throat> Thanks for giving us uh, some of your precious time to share with you, um, well, on my side, some of the research that I've been doing now for years in the space of Agile and DevOps and testing, of course, which is uh, I've just tremendously seen the changes happening in this industry uh, that uh, on one side I've been predicting, but uh, it's nice to see those predictions happen. So it looks like we are doing something right from a research perspective. And today, we're going to be focusing on. For me, it's a kind of a you know new topic. It's my first webinar where I'm where I'm directly addressing the issue of packaged apps, and it is a different world from custom development, which is where I kind of live and, and breathe every day. And but um, fortunately, I also have a good uh, great partner here, which is Chris, who's going to dive deeper into some of the how you know some of these uh, how some of the practices that I talk about. Um, do happen in the packaged world. So he's he's kind of got the hard job. I got the easy one. With that, let me dive into it uh, uh, straight away. Um, so I think it's you know it goes with no uh, discussion that today organizations are really all trying to uh, adopt more digital in their organization. They're trying to transform to digital. They're trying to accelerate the digital transformation. So. You know, usually I, find, I, I like to showcase some uh, examples of digital, but I think we all kind of see that and know that every day. So I just kind of cut it short and get to the point. And the point is that digital matters for everyone, right? And if digital matters, the question is, what is it that makes digital successful? Well, that's, that starts to be, you know, kind of a little bit less straightforward for some organizations, although many get it. But um, and I, when I ask audiences about this, it's funny on the different answers that I get. But for me and many and maybe I'm biased uh, being an applicant, you know, an analyst that writes in the application development delivery global team of Forrester. But for me, the obvious answer is it's software that makes digital successful. Right. And, you know, whether whether it's uh, packaged applications, custom application built, and if it's whether you're sourcing, insourcing, outsourcing, it doesn't matter, but the end at the end of the day, it's 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 re, you know your success as a digital organization will depend on how you deliver that software, right? How great you are in developing, delivering, testing, and deploying that software. And again, whether it's business applications, custom app developed, outsourced or insourced, you know, depending on the sourcing strategy, that's another conversation we can have. But basically, the point is that. It really is having an exit. It's very important for, for any organizations, be it a bank, be it a airline, be it an enterprise, a telecom, telecom enterprise or retail. It doesn't matter which industry you have to be. be you have to have an excellent you know, process in doing this. It's, it's kind of one of your most important business processes, I would say, operational processes to be able to deliver great software to your clients faster and with great quality. So what is out there that is enabling all this to happen? And uh, well, I think uh, there's a many there's, there's a lot going on in the industry. And uh, you know, we all we all know we see uh, every day the new technologies, the cloud, the serverless, the containers, but from a process perspective, what really brings end to end agility and with end to end agility, I mean, from, you know, the time somebody comes up with an idea to the time it takes to deploy that idea into production and consume the idea to have that level of agility all the way through it's agile and DevOps and agile and DevOps are two sides of the same coin. I like highlighting that 
for many, it's not that straightforward. I'm always happy to have deep conversations in that space. But basically, my view is, and based on what I'm seeing clients doing, that they really get that end-to-end -end agility when they're doing these, you know, both agile and DevOps together, when they're being agile and they're adopting DevOps together. And they are two sides of the same coin. You can't do one without the other. Well, you can do one without the other, but you're not going to get the real benefits if you do. And so agile is like driving, you know, that great red car you see on the left with, you know, which has great quality, gives you a great customer experience and with speed. But you know what? That speed and the quality you get with a Ferrari, you won't really enjoy it if you don't have a proper infrastructure to run it on. If you don't have the right road or freeway or you know general roads to run that car on, to drive it on. And that road, that infrastructure has to have grip. It has to be secure. It has to scale. When you get close to a large city, you know, think about entering a, a metro, a, you know, a large city, and you have to get off the freeway. The infrastructure has to scale properly for letting millions and hundreds of cars off, uh, off at the same time and not bumping into each other. Well, it's kind of the same from, a, from, from, from if you bring the analogy in the software world, where if you really want to, you, if you really want to capitalize on the speed that you're getting with your business in working agile and not having to bump into something that is siloed, something that is hard to change, a process that is slow or manual and is not helping you deliver fast on the infrastructure, you're not going to get the benefit. So agile infrastructure becomes extremely crucial. So agile, it has to be also at the infrastructure level. It has to scale. And, and, and it's a big automation, right? That's why we talk a lot about automation as well. But the important thing between these two worlds is having a shared and common goal for the business and therefore having a common language. I think about driving down that freeway and not recognizing a post, a sign that tells you maybe, you know, there's a sec there's a cross section down the road or there's a there, there's a bumper uh, down the road at 100, you know, my, at 100 uh, meters away. And if you can't read that sign or you don't understand it, it will be pretty dangerous. Well, it's the same thing. Developers and, and operations, they have to have a common language. They, the one, you know, the developers need to understand what the limits and what the, and, and what the, the, the needs in, in for, for the ops people to run their operations safely and securely. And, and uh, but the infrastructure folks need to understand the creativity, the speed and the new, you know, the new continuous delivery requirements that developers have. So that's 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 all about this end-to-end -end agility. So um, you don't have to take my words for this. I've got great data that shows that organizations that are doing agile and teams in those organizations that are doing just agile versus teams that are doing both agile and DevOps, we've got data that shows the differences and the benefits, the greater benefits of doing of doing a one, all of this as one transformation, right? A united transformation between cutting across the organizations. The data shows that basically, you know, if you ask the teams that are just doing agile alone, 41% of them responded, we get faster business value with agile. But the teams that are doing agile and DevOps together, one transformation, they say 69% of them would say that faster business, they get faster business value by doing them together. Frequency of delivery goes from 75 to 83 percent. This is already high at the Agile level, but it goes even higher, of course, when you're doing both Agile and DevOps together. And another couple of data points is around quality. You can see how quality is impressively improving when you're doing Agile and DevOps together. And, uh, and, and even functional quality is improving too, both technical and, and, and functional. I would say that, of course, that's because we are also transforming testing, and that's where we will we, you know, we're going to get to in a minute. This comes from my agile survey panel that I'm going to dive a little bit more deeper in in a few minutes. So the data shows that this is this is you know this is uh, this is is true and happening. Okay. Ah, uh, Heather. Yep, I'm here. I'm Are afraid that I, yeah, it looks like I'm stuck at the slide. I'm wondering if you want to. Yep. Heather, just can... pass present to me. Got it. Sorry for that. Uh, so anyway, I was just going to sh share the next slide where I'm coming back to the 
agile. Oh, okay. It it suddenly it suddenly unlocked. Here we go. So basically, um, you know, testing is in the mid. Testing is in the middle of, uh, of of all this. It's it's not something that uh, it's not something that uh, you know that can stay the way we we uh, we 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 used to uh, we used to have. And so um, you know, agile basically works on the left side of the graphic, uh, which improves your build, test, and ideation. And DevOps works on the test, release, and monitoring side of things. And, and basically, the other thing that, uh, of course, uh, DevOps brings is this feedback loop. And, and so, um, and thanks to all this going on, basically, this is how we can get to continuous software delivery. And it really, if you think about, you know, this process, how fast we need to move and the, the level of automation that we're bringing in with CI, CD, testing can't definitely stay the same, right? Testing is, is in the middle of this turbulence. And uh, and the change uh, and and there's a lot of change that has to happen. So um, in the next uh, in the next slide, you'll you'll see what I mean with uh, continuous testing, right? Um, and uh, and basically, uh, it's it means um, that testing is going on right throughout the entire process continuously, from the ideation to um, the build to continuous integration to deployment and automate and to feedback. It's it's like a continuous process where process where you're building, you're you're ideating, you're building code, you're throwing it in a repository, which and and you know unit tests get kicked off, um, functional tests get kicked off, non-functional tests get kicked off, and it all it, it all is orchestrated in an automate in, you know, in an automated way. And so basically what that means is that it, you know, it means that uh, the processes that the orchestration of testing is automated, the uh, execution of automation needs to be more and more automated. But finally, what we're seeing also is the design of automation needs to get more automated. So I like to talk about ruthless automation when we talk about continuous testing. Okay, next slide, please. So basically, um, the um, I, I run every two years a a, a, a survey, a panel of uh, um, on the uh, to kind of understand where the the state of agile is in the industry. And you can see in in uh, in slide number ten that um, in the last four years, from two thousand thirteen to two well six years, I would say from starting 2013, 14, 15, 16, and 17 in the last, you know, in these last, in these last four years, what you can see happening is that the teams that are doing agile in organizations um, have grown. And basically we've got more teams that are, that are in the, in the area of delivering more than 75% of their, of their projects in agile and um and and uh and less teams of uh, teams and organizations that are just starting that are with less than 25 percent of uh of projects going on in agile but the bulk of the of the state in those organizations is is right in the middle right they're in between somewhere between 25 and 75 percent i know that's a big range but basically it shows more or less where the industry is at least from from what i see now in the next slide, what I'm trying to highlight here is, uh, you know, one of the questions in the survey is, is asking what type of software development is the organization primarily responsible for? And there's various options and, you know, some of the options that you don't see on the slide are custom development, mobile development. But the interesting thing is that across all those options, and they can give multiple answers, you can see that there's quite a bit, there's more than 50% answering that agile is done at the departmental or the app dev team level for custom or package right we don't we can't we can't uh, we can't say that these are all packaged app uh, projects but the next one we can where departmental it for internal apps you know they're using packaged app packaged applications like erp crm plm so forth uh, central it again um, for internal applications this is not departmental this is central 
packaged application software like, again, ERP. So both at the departmental level and at the enterprise level, package stacks are being built. And central IT for even for mobile applications development, this is again a mix of custom and packaged. We can safely say that more than 50% of the development projects of these agile teams going on is for package, right? So I think that's a that's a strong data point to say that uh, you know agile is not just for custom development. And actually, my survey, I can see there's quite a few of those um, uh, of, of, of package that going on. So in the next slide, you see the high level summary of that study, and uh, this is an S for scale. It's not a sequence of steps. And what I do in the survey is that I try to kind of distinguish and segment the respondents between expert firms and uh, no fight. The expert firms are those being agile and in other words, I'm do, you know, they're, they're being agile with more than 50% of their projects and they're being quite successful with it. In other words, when you look at the data of the benefits, they're higher. And you will see, actually, if you uh, download uh, the, if you're a Forrester client, you can download the research, but uh, you can see also later that the expert firms have just better results than the nilfite firms. And why is that? Well, they kind of do these practices that you see here. Again, this is not the order in which they do the practices and they adopt the practices. It's just, you know, uh, it's just a schematic way of, of showing things here. But the, you know, the expert firms, focus on changing the organization mindset. If they're adopting Agile and DevOps, they've got a change, a very careful change management program that tries to make experiences in Agile and DevOps and continuous delivery an immersive one, for example. Management is asked to become servant leaders and there's training going on for doing that. There's selection of people that want to move into that direction. They are mixing and matching different Agile practices. They're mixing Scrum with Kanban, they're mixing Scrum with XP, uh, you know, few people know that continuous integration is an XP technique. Well, at least they're doing Agile with XP, uh, you know, with, with continuous integration, for example, but they're mixing and matching the best practices. Nobody just takes one framework, one methodology and applies it to the book. The next thing is number three is very important is organization, organizing in cross-functional teams or integrated product teams. This is really important for that end-to-end -end agility that we talked about. They apply agile in the upstream and in the downstream. I use this terminology because I, you know, I've been right. I've been asking these questions or these agile questions for about eight years now. And, at the, you know, eight years ago, DevOps wasn't around. So I was distinguishing between those that were just adopting Scrum as a project management level versus those that were applying some agile engineering aspects like test driven development, continuous integration. So agile more on the ops, on the on the engineering side. And you can see that the, the expert firms do both more. They don't just do agile. They don't apply agile. They don't become agile just in the upstream. They also become agile in the downstream. This terminology we go, will go away going forward because it will be superseded by the agile and DevOps discussion that we had. They implement continuous testing. I'm going to come back to that in a minute to, 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 to share with you what that means, right? That they are changing the way they test. Testing is not any longer a centralized function, for example, only. It's not, uh, you know, the ma ma it's, it's, it's the level of automation increases, it's shifting left, etc. And they complement Agile with DevOps. They, you saw the numbers for this, right? You saw the numbers in the previous slide where complementing in the sense of doing it together, right? Doing what's missing in Agile and that DevOps brings together will improve the way they scale agile and last but not least you know at least is this focus on this newly recently focus on budgets and extending agile you know uh, new using new sizing techniques and new metrics so there's a whole journey that the, the expert firms go through to be more successful at scaling agile and this report summarizes all of them so in the next slide number 13 you can see some of the key metrics. This slide shows two things. One, the type of metrics that they use. The other one is also to distinguish and you know, sharing how the expert firms do get better results compared to the no fights, the, 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 darker, the darker green guys versus the lighter green bars, which are the, the expert firms. The expert firms do better by doing all those practices that we just talked about. 
but the type of of uh, of metrics are you know measuring frequency of of releases measuring improved customer experience uh, measuring the better business alignment with better business alignment it's improved functional quality technical quality and so forth so um just a, a little deep dive in the next slide from the testing perspective because this is today uh, after all about testing um you can see that they are uh, you know in 2017 this is reporting what level of performance functional and shift left and test you know some, some questions that were asked to these teams uh, in the percentage percentages of of, uh, of achievement in that space so 48 percent are doing some performance testing 62 percent some functional testing they are starting to shift performance to the left you know what that means that means that they're, they're looking at performance issues early on rather than just later on with a big end-to-end -end performance test which might still needed to be done but they're shifting more performance testing left they are testers are part of an integrated delivery team right that's very important because that's what agile wants these collaborative integrated uh, you know functional teams and then in the, the the second half of the screen you can see again the the the, the experts and the nail fights the experts doing more in terms of continuous testing in terms of automating functional tests in, ter in terms of of um, uh, you know functional tests which are ui led record and replay versus going beyond the ui and doing um, you know, performance testing and and, uh, and non-functional testing. So just a little bit of a sharing of some of the numbers on continuous testing. The report has much more, but uh, uh, but you know, I, I I only given given the limited amount of time, um, I I just wanted to share these with you. And in the next slide, this is interesting because I wrote this about you know in 2013. Uh, I said, you know, in three to five years, the TIS testing center entrance, as we know it, will change, uh, shifting to become more of a practice center. I think I even said in some blog, we'll be dead, but it was kind of provocative. But what's happening is that testers are moving down, as you can see in this slide, in, in the development uh, teams, in the development and delivery teams, right, to form these cross-functional teams. But you still have a piece of the practice center that is, um, you know, the practice center that uh, is has a centralized team, and uh, the centralized team can be, especially for package apps, as you can see, there's still, you know, regression testing that ha might have to be done that cuts across the different teams, so that might be managed centrally, uh, or end-to-end -end testing that cuts across different teams. Um, so there is a central part of the test center of excellence which focuses on specialized activities like performance perhaps perhaps performance testing where maybe people are you know um focusing on some of the best practices for automation the frameworks the tools that need to be used and might be supporting the teams in the in the cross-functional teams the, the testers in the cross-functional teams that are actually running testing day in day out so let's quickly see in the next slide. I want to run you through um, the 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 new you know the 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 the, the state of uh, of uh, of actually continuous testing, and and how it uh, it actually um, you know what what are some of the areas that are changing? And, and Chris, I guess you can just click through all of them and bring them out, and I'll just uh, talk over uh, quickly. And so you can see that ruthless ruthless automation. I kind of talked about that a little bit. Uh, when I mentioned that it's about not just execution testing, right? It's not just about improving execution testing, which is what everybody kind of these days try to tries to uh, focus on. But it's also about designing and automating the design of automation, being able from requirements from models to generate designs. You'll see later that AI is kind of helping in that space. It's building and shifting quality in from the beginning, meaning testers, developers, and VAs or product owners sit together from the very beginning, defining a very clear definition of done. It means having new organizations and roles. That means we are seeing testers, developers doing a bit more testing, but we're seeing testers moving more into the developer's role. But we're also seeing you know, this business role as you're given tools that make it easier for you to automate. We talked about performance, shifting, shift, performance testing shifting left, service virtualization has been around now for some time still you know kind of an emerging technology i would say but pretty well established but again you need to automate also 
automation integration, uh, the integration of, of testing, uh, integration testing. We're seeing also testing and you know, security, big, to, big topic, huge topic, getting more automated, you know, whether it's uh, you know, through scanning tools, whether it's uh, static or dynamic, and more of that is happening. Test data management, new life cycles for supporting the agile life cycle, testing that is getting more synthetically created for, you know, for GDPR, or if you're using GDPR, getting it from production, but being very careful in how you obfuscate the data. Those practices become all very crucial when you're doing Agile and DevOps. With Waterfall, they were kind of a nice to have, but with, with Agile and DevOps, they all become, I would say, mandatory. And last but not least is artificial intelligence. You know, where, but I'm going to come back to that uh, and spend a few words uh, uh, in, a, in, a, in a few minutes. So going to the next slide, I just wanted to share with you the um, the criteria that I use, because one thing that I also do is I uh, I, I just uh, released a wave, uh, which is kind of a vendor evaluation for um, a vendor evaluation for the um, uh, for for, for omni channel uh, functional testing tools, right on the tool side, and uh, and you can see that the you know the list of criteria that I typically look at is things like you know operating environments or platforms. The tools run in, do they run on the cloud or SaaS? What's the level of automation at the UI level, the level of automation provided at the API level, uh, at the design, testing design level? Um, and then there's a, also a criteria on packaged application testing. There is criteria on automation execution for and level of continuous testing, qualities integration, you know, mainframe and divine testing, just to give you a flavor of some of the criteria that I evaluate. Now, the, the the percentages that you see on the side are just arbitrarily chosen by me. Well, kind of based on the importance in the context of the way, but usually our clients can customize those because if you are a package application tester, probably uh, organization, you'll probably bring that, uh, you know, that percentage up much higher. Um, but the other thing I wanted to show you is that in the area of packaged application testing, things that you might be looking at, I just looked at a subset of these, but if you're choosing a tool for automating in, the, in, in that world, you know, you'll be looking at things like, well, what uh, platforms does it cover? What can I, can I test SAP, Oracle, Salesforce? What testing personas does it address? Well, maybe you're less interested in having you know, a, a, a developer tester that likes to code and maybe more of a technical or a business tester you uh, still want to look at how does the tool allow you to integrate that tool into a CI CD and in the package world of course things are a bit more complicated or different at least you can't just get Jenkins and use it right on the you know on, on one of those platforms that you might be using uh, API testing types of protocols and you know you might have more data driven aspects that you might want to look at is it SaaS what level of AI and, and partner strategy is another important uh, you know, is another important issue. What partner strategy does the vendor have? Because in the space of packaged apps, partners, system integrators play a big role. So let me go to the next slide very quickly and uh, just share a few words on this. In the same wave, I asked the vendors all brought like two or three uh, customers references that uh, uh, actually three or more uh, customer references. And you can see that generally speaking, this this data point just shows that um, that customers are are kind of happy with uh, with, uh, with with the support they're getting from their vendor. Right. Nineteen said extremely good. Twenty two said good. And, uh, so, you know, four are kind of uh, acceptable and poor, which is a good sign. I mean, it looks like the tools are starting to help customers move into the right direction that we need to. But if you look at the next slide, slide 19, and we talk about specifically automation, you'll see that it's a bit all over the place. So there are some clients that are achieving, they're doing Agile and DevOps, the context for the wave was Agile and DevOps. You can see that they are achieving above 81%, some of them, of automation, functional test automation. Um, but there's a whole lot, you know, all over the place. And generally speaking, I think, you know, my assumption, my, my, my what I'm thinking, what I keep saying is, you know what, is still generally low. Despite the efforts and the, and the investments, this is still low, right? And the next point I want to make with slide, uh, you know, with, with slide number, uh, with slide number 22, is that um, 
uh, sorry, slide 20, uh, is that um, omnichannel roles, the skills and the roles for are, are kind of addressed from some tools. Uh, some roles are being addressed better than others. Some roles are being addressed better than others, like right? they're being provided the right tools. So a great support is given to the technical testers, those that don't necessarily program and are not necessarily business testers. They are kind of techy enough to understand code, perhaps to talk to the coders, to the developers themselves. They won't be really writing code, but um, the, if things are improving for the dev testers, right? Those that actually like to automate and you give them an IDE with a programming language and they start cranking automation code right away. But we're doing a quite poor job on, on, on offering a solution that is ideal for business testers, right? So there's something that needs to improve there. Now, the reason why I bring those points up is because the question is, okay, so, you know, we've been focusing on automation now for quite some years. Tools are improving, are changing, we're changing practices. But still, the results are kind of, you know, kind of lagging. Now, I, I don't think I, we can't blame just the tools. This is about skills and also. Uh, and so the question, I guess, is given all this uh, big interest around AI is, well, can AI change things? Can AI really be the one that will truly augment and automate testers? And I'm writing a new research at right now, as we, you know, as I speak, when I'm off this webinar, I'll be keeping, continue writing it. I'm writing a research because I've been kind of doing the research for the last 18 months, talking to a very large ecosystem. Uh, and uh, with, you know, next slide 22, um, talking to GSI's global system integrators who are uh, doing some of the, some activities with, uh, with, uh, with AI and with, um, with their clients, with new startups that are injecting some and creating some new tools with AI, and even the existing tool vendors, tool vendors that are also experimenting by using basically machine learning, deep learning, and you know natural language processing. And some of the use cases that I'm seeing, you can click uh, um, uh, all the options up, um, Chris. Uh, so you know it is we're seeing that they're using machine learning to start thinking about how can I test smarter and test less, and which means I can increase the percentage of automation. Well, by using machine learning and knowing what's happening in production, for example, what are the features that uh, your customers are using, you can kind of get that information and, and intersect that with the regression tests and see if they're, you know, what that intersection looks like. Or you can even improve, maybe figure out and find out, well, maybe the, you know, based on what we're testing and what customers are using, the requirements might need to be, you know, the process might need to be fixed. Um, the next point is about augmenting testers with better insights. It's using machine learning, deep learning to take out of the tons of data that we produce during testing time, get great insights, again, that can help us improve the test strategy or can help us understand, for example, you know um, what what what, uh, what what we're what 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 could be happening if we um, you know if we change things in a certain direction. Um, there's optimization and generation of test cases themselves. That's the design, automating the design, starting from requirements, starting from uh, models, and generating the test cases, and not just the scripts for the test cases. It's increasing the generation, the automation generation, the, the generation of automation code itself. It's in the bug space, like uh, using, you know, data that we have in, in, the, um, in, in, the, in the log file, perhaps in the results of the tests, uh, in, in, the, uh, in, in, in sentiment analysis that we might be gathering in, in, you know, in production. Use all that to kind of ca uh, categorize bugs and clusters so that we can fix them sooner. Um, test data is another one, right? Today, most uh, some of, some tools use combinatorial and just generate all the possible ways that you need to pass data into your into your test cases so that you can get good coverage. Well, maybe there is a variation of the data that you can optimal variation of the data that can be used for uh, testing for for testing more in a more optimal way to test cases. And last but not least is even automating customer being able to automate some customer experience testing. Now, I don't have time to go more in depth on this, but uh, I all of these have behind them concrete use cases and people that are starting to use AI technology to improve the way they test. And my last slide, number 23, is so 
my conclusion is right is you know you i do meet a lot of customers that are still kind of i mean most of the industry is says okay we are we know we need to be more agile we and we want to be more agile but there's still some skeptical sometimes and so but that's for agile it's going to be the same i think when you try to adopt ai as the next uh, thing coming in with agile and devops uh, and so my point really is that you know if you think that uh, because you're in the package world you can't really do these things well i would say think twice because if you're not doing it i can assure your competitors are doing it and uh, and so you know i think it's the right time to start to to, to start to pushing the agenda also faster even in the packaged world for for agile for devops and for continuous testing and as we will see the next big thing coming with ai and with that i um i thank you very much for your attention and sorry for the small glitch on the slideshow and uh, i will hand it uh, back to heather or chris whoever takes the lead thank you thank you diego it's always great to hear about what you're doing because you talk to so many customers and so many people interesting interested in being best in class, right? They're, they're striving for excellence. And so it's always enlightening. So what I'm gonna talk about is if that's the art of the possible and why you wanna do all these great things in Agile plus DevOps, I'm gonna talk about some specifics of how you can accomplish that with WorkSoft. So the analogy I like to use with people is our modern enterprise applications, are they houses or cities? Because Agile started with here's a very specific blueprint, here's a plan I want to implement, and I'm going to build a house, no one's living in it, but the great thing is there's a lot of infrastructure behind it. There's roads, there's water, there's electricity, and there's, of course, the important internet. So we see that as like building a custom app, and that's where um, Agile got its starts, and that's where DevOps started to build. But in reality, enterprise applications are more like you're reclaiming parts of the city. The trick is with enterprise applications, they're running your business, so you have to transform while you're continuing to run. So when you reclaim part of the city, you can't shut off the water and the power for convenience. You have to keep it running, you have to keep the roads running. So we feel that when you're working with modern enterprise applications or ERP applications, it's more like reclaiming a city. You're updating it while you're working on it. So. Of course, that means you're gonna have a release train. Hopefully it's a high-speed train with lots of cars behind it. So one of the things that we look at with customers is they say, we've got some mobile apps that are making changes. They're like building a house. We've got this web app, they're building a house. But in reality, the enterprise applications, the ERP applications have to work with those. So you may have two different Jira projects that you're generating change lists from because they're in different versions of Subversion or GitHub. And then you've got things like large ERP packages are using Solman or Panaya because they have a lot of requirements to do analysis and auditing of those things. And those are SAP transports. Well, the problem is there's a lot of different tools that have to work together to roll out these big ERP changes because there's changes in mobile, which affect the way you view data in the web, which actually affect your larger ERP packages. So we see this as definitely a release train. One of the big problems is like, there's no consistent requirements in many cases because we've got stories and different boards and different technologies. There's no consolidated change list because some teams use Get, GitHub subversion or you've got like transports and master data updates and ERPs. So actually there's a big problem. How do you understand where the large business process lies? You know, a big change could be a hundred steps, right? And multiple sprint teams are working together in parallel to make this happen. Okay. There's no easy map between here's a requirement to my source control, my change list, and my chest management. So one of my great customers, an SAP functional lead said, it's really hard to know to exactly what to test when the business processes are so distributed, right? So if we think about where Agile came from, a lot of Diego's research said, yes, people are getting good at DevOps, but it's like what the Phoenix project talked about. We have a small package, they're not doing a lot of pre-prod. The goal is to move from the development, get it vetted and moved in production, right? And so for small changes and single sprint teams, this works really well. But once those sprint teams start talking to other people, you know, developers start conspiring with security and throw an update out, well, we know what happens, right? The Phoenix project, right? Something goes horribly wrong and it's hard to figure out what's happened. So a key consideration is for your end-to-end -end business processes. Okay, stop the madness, because we know what happens is you have too many integrations with a big SAP project, 
One of the biggest challenges is testing. So what happens? We get a bunch of people together in a room, we order a stack of pizzas, and we spend all weekend verifying that the system's working from the end-to-end -end perspective, right? Who owns the test creation and the maintenance for the end-to-end -end process when all those sprint teams are coming together? You know, do we have good reusability and scalability of our tests and our continuous integration and continuous testing cycles? You know, UIs are version. In many cases, these big key processes have compliance requirements, right? And so there's a lot of upstream, downstream considerations we have to work through, but we still have to make the auditors happy. So I was thrilled when Diego was talking about the center of excellence is moving to the practice center, right? He predicted this is back in 2013, and we're really seeing this happen. People are not just turn off their COEs for testing. What they're talking about is to become federated, and it's an enterprise problem where how do we keep the end-to-end -end processes working? Because there's specializations these people have. Test automation specialists know how to test. They know how to do functional and non-functional tests. And so they're being distributed across those teams, right? And so they, they, they are working a lot with product owners and portfolio management people to understand what's the end-to-end -end process and let's get all this validated or tested in pre-production when we have the entire systems together. So what I'm seeing with my customers is it's very federated and the way they're taking their approach for the COE. The interesting thing is they're saying we can't get all of our testing done as part of our done done criteria. What they're saying is in sprints that are working together, they get their small functional tests, but there is the functional integration test. How do these three or four stories work together? Well, traditionally it's at the feature level, right? In agile, multiple stories make a feature. So order to cache would be a feature. And we need to make sure that all the stories work together to create that. So if you think about the, the loop of continuous integration and continuous testing, we see continuous integration and unit level testing happen at the, at the unit for the sprint, but then the functional tests are falling into your continuous testing loop. And that's where we wanna take what we've built and leverage it, but also build functional end-to-end -end integration tests and pass that back to the teams to run as their as their end-to-end -end continuous testing. So what this looks like is the teams are building stories, they have their little bits, but then someone's gonna build a function, a functional test that goes across the entire feature, and that's gonna get checked into our automation library. And in most cases, they need a center of practice or center of excellence or center of competency whatever you want to call it, those people maintain those tests and they worry about making sure they're running the pre-production environment and they're vetting the environments before they deploy. They're making sure the outcomes of those become their continuous um, testing and they have their validations, right? So how would that actually work? So what we suggest is maybe your artifact of your functional validation of story is something a business person could do inside of your sprint. What they could do is they can say, I'm going to name this test bike parts. So they want to actually test the story for bike parts. Maybe they put a comment. This is, you know, Jira 234 um, bike part orders, right? So they're going to document. And what they're going to do is they're going to walk through the process and actually use the system. So what I'm doing is I'm capturing everything they're doing within the user interface, because in many cases, the end-end -end process is lots of services working together and lots of applications integrating and moving data. So in this case, as I walk through the application, you'll notice the capture screen is capturing and documenting everything I'm entering. So this kind of looks like a great way to start building my test scripts, right? So if I know how the user is expected to use the system, well, that's usually a discovery problem. It's, it's, it's difficult to know what they're actually doing, and then what is all the fields and the data they're interested in? Because behind this, there can be 17 service calls, and maybe there's integration to the warehouse management system and pricing engines and so forth to get all this data, right? So the idea is they're gonna come through, I'm gonna click this is a standard order, and actually go put a note to say save the order number for the delivery, so the idea is the business user should be able to do this. Now, if you remember on Diego's slide, it said the business people don't have as much um, automation as the people who are technical testers and developers, right? Okay, it's a proven fact I can't type a password and talk, so I had to pause. So what they do is they create this 
as their documentation of their done done for the end of sprint, right? So now I'm going to come in. Uh, yep. And come into my central analyze system, and I now have a great deliverable. What I can do is I have an automatic gen doc, so I can see this happen in real time, which shows me everything the user did in the system. Okay, this is documentation of the process, it's all the screens, and more importantly, it's all the data they entered. So we know all the data they entered into the fields. So this allows them to say, this is working as designed, I'm happy with this. And these business people can handshake this to the people in the practice centers, and they can start um, going from a federated model to a central location for central testing. So the idea is if I have this documentation, I know exactly what happened, so there's no mystery there. I can then go through and do all my analysis of consolidating my tests, getting together, and then we'll generate the automation. So the nice thing from the Worksoft perspective, all I have to do is say, this is great, I have my listings, and I've documented my processes, I can now generate my automation. So what are some key considerations? It looks really easy when it's in a simple um, demonstration, but how does this really work? Because one of the problems is we found is the weakest link in many customer sites is continuous testing. And it's because there's lots of teams checking to the CI platforms. Pre-production tends to be an amalgamation of lots of people's work, their features working together, not just their stories. So when we talk about ERP packaging, um, or testing, it really needs to extend through continuous integration to the continuous delivery. And people want to be more agile. So we need to consider what are all the tools they're working with and realize a lot of the things the users see in their perspective is very UI driven. They log in and out of different systems, they work through different versions and updates, and they're very interested in that orchestration of the tests and how I get them to work at scale. So how complex is that tool chain? Well, um, it's it's enormously complex because the people in continuous integration, they're using JIRA, they're using X-Ray and Zephyr, but then the continuous testing side, this may be more traditional ALM people, they're using Agile Central, they're using Solution Manager, MicroFocus, HP ALM tools. So you're gonna have to integrate with a lot of these different tools to get the results back in the right spot. So when you run your, your continuous testing, sometimes the results go back to Zephyr and X-Ray, Sometimes the results go to Panaya, other times they go to Solution Manager and MicroFocus because different audiences have different systems of record to prove that it's working. So you need to be able to integrate with all of those. And of course, with Worksoft, we do that. So one thing that people are very interested in is, well, what does it look like to run a UI-driven test from my continuous integration environment? Okay. So um, I'll close out of here and clean up my desktop. So um, of course, the minute you say continuous integration, the first thing you think of is Jenkins, right? So if I want to test the UI, traditionally, this is a problem in Jenkins. Because continuous, and I can't type my password and talk. Oh, really? Okay, you got to watch me time my password wrong three times. So continuous integration in the end in realm looks a lot like traditional Jenkins, but we'll see here, we've got like run the bookmarks daily. So this Jenkins job is scheduled to run every morning and it starts running my end in validations. And the reason I do that is because a lot of times if I've got multiple teams checking in, they may have specific tests that run to check their browsers or check their orders in Fiori, but other people need to run tests from the HP ALM tools because um, that's where their systems of record are. So from our perspective, we want to look like a normal Jenkins build. So this kicked off automatically at 6 a.m., but what I'm going to do is run it now. And so what happens is your end-to-end -end tests, like I mentioned, tends to be more user-focused and UI-driven. So what happens is we need a machine to log in, a desktop to run things. So what I'm gonna do is log in.
and spy on this machine. So the Jenkins job started. I can see it's running. And, and now if I look, what I'll see over here is I actually have technology with Workstop, which is going to allow me to log into a Windows desktop and act like a real user and log in and run my end-to-end -end workflows and validate them. Um, now, the trick is there's going to be lots of different technologies. Sometimes it's Excel spreadsheets. Sometimes it's, I need to verify my email that I got something. Other times it's, it's working through a UI like SAP GUI. So what we find is people are very interested in moving to continuous testing, but they have challenges because a lot of it has to look more like the user than look like um, pure um, API integration. So what we do is we allow you to do this from Jenkins. You can do your UI testing, and that Jenkins make, this could be Bamboo or any of the other tools, but it's gonna trigger your unit test as part of the build, but also trigger your end-to-end -end validations. So that's what it looks like when you actually run your test, say, from an end-to-end -end process, but from a Jenkins build. And the last thing I wanna close with is a case study. So we do consider this a, a automation journey, right? So our customers say, you know, we're, we're on a journey to, to maximize our automation. Now, a lot of times they leave it generic as automation because what they want is continuous testing to be automated, their continuous integration to be automated, and they want robotic process automation. So this is one of my customers, Cardinal Healthcare, and they're on this journey and they've done a great job. Um, basically what they've done is they started their automation journey with Certify to do their, their, their testing, and then they started running their tests as part of the continuous, continuous integration. And then they realized a subset of these tests are really going to be helpful for RPA. So they, they adopted Agile as their methodology, and automation is everybody's job as part of the Agile methodology. They consolidated their high-maintenance SAP tests from HUFT and Turnkey into Certify. They used Capture, like I did, to automate um, their tests in Manhattan, which means the business users could give them examples of this is how I'm working through Manhattan Associates. They saw the scripts, they understood what was happening, it generated the automation, and then they extended that for their mass configurations. Because in package applications like SAP in Manhattan, a lot of your app updates are not code, they're actually master data configuration. They're adding new parts, new build materials, things like that. What they found is they had a 40% reduction in their automation uh, maintenance because they moved to a scriptless technology like Worksoft. They reduced their regression test execution cycles by 60% because it ran faster in the consolidated redundant things. And they automated 90% of their sprint coverage because they were really focused on automation as everyone's job as part of their agile journey. And then the last bit of, they got was they got 85% reduction in mass configuration efforts. So when they had to move data in between systems and reapply pricing and build materials and all those things you'd have in a Manhattan system, by automating that, they reduce the manual effort. And so huge ROI by looking at automation is the key um, component of met, um, an agile um, adoption. So here's some related resources. Um, these are um, downloads available, and there's demos on YouTube for all these different things. So at this point, I'll pass back to Heather for Q&A. Okay. 